20. Welcome to the future of entertainment, blockchain and digital ticketing, sponsored by the Boston Blockchain Association. I am Nate Rand, board member of BBA and MC for tonight's event. A little background on the Boston Blockchain Association. Since 2018, the association has been focused on achieving three main goals. To advance blockchain technologies, both locally and globally, to establish Massachusetts as a global hub for blockchain technology, and to support and connect blockchain professionals with useful resources. Today, the BBA includes over 1,600 individual members, 10 corporate and two government members. Those that which are listed uh, here, Algorand, PureStake, Bloomy, Media Shower, Cordano, Fabric, the Boston Federal Reserve, and the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative. The agenda for tonight, we'll have a fantastic panel discussion followed by questions from our audience. Please submit your questions using the button located at the bottom of your Crowdcast screen and vote on the questions that most interest you. Your votes will prioritize the questions that we will ask. Finally, breakout rooms with each of our panelists will provide a more formal uh, setting for you to engage them directly. Links to each breakout room will be provided via the chat window later in our program. Mike Wise, the BBA board chair, is going to moderate tonight's event and introduce our panelists. Mike, over to you. Great, thanks, Nate. So I, um, a Bitcoin walks into a bar and the bartender says, hey, we don't serve your kind here. And the Bitcoin guy says, why not? I'm a fungible guy. Oh. Yeah, it's good, it's a good one. So, Thanks a lot, everybody, for, for coming. Really appreciate it. I also wanted to give a shout out to all of our BBA volunteers, Eric Rue, Peter Brooks, John Hargrave, Sam Nathans, the man behind the curtain, Lily Chen, Stephen Leahy, Warren Brown, Doug McCallum, Mario Souza, Pete Scahill, Veronica Lucurio, Caroline Dennis, Gretchen Wilson, Kenrick, Nelson and our newest guy, Andrew Cousins, uh, a, a student at Northeastern. So we've done, so far since COVID, we've done uh, a couple sessions around COVID. Um, we've done CBDC, digital identity, supply chains, blockchain bonds, regulatory nodes, voting and GovTech with Cubic Labs and DeFi. And now we're gonna be dealing with ticketing. So I talked to Matt Zaracina last uh, uh, August and he was just, uh, what he was talking about in terms of the, the dynamic change, the disruption that's gonna be happening because of blockchain technology in the ticketing space. I, I said, we just have to have um, a session on this. And he was kind enough to organize this panel. So. I'm just going to share a couple more slides. Um, so um, Matt, why don't you introduce yourself and um, and then we'll go to Kristen and Nicole. Great, thanks Mike. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Zarcina. I'm the CEO of True Tickets. Uh, we are a B2B enterprise SaaS solution for secure digital ticket delivery. We essentially secure the ticket from point of sale to point of scan for our venue clients. And we have one of them on the call today. So Nicole will talk about that. We are actually live and in use in Miami at the Adrian Arts Center. And this would only be possible also too with our ticketing CRM partner. So the Adrian Arts Center uses a system called Tessitura, which we now provide the, the solution for the, um, the broader network uh, of their 700 or so global clients. I think 700, 10 countries, three continents, Kristen? Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, good memory. <laughs> um, cool, well, I'm Kristen Darrow. I'm Senior Vice President of Product at Tessitura. Uh, really glad to be here today uh, with all of you blockchain folks. Um, so Tessitura is the leading ticketing, fundraising, CRM system for arts and culture organizations uh, across 10 countries worldwide. Uh, we really deliver technology and services uh, that literally run the arts and culture business um, for these for these institutions. So 
we serve nonprofits and we are ourselves a nonprofit company uh, building software. So we are we operate just like any software uh, high tech company, but we are essentially owned and managed by the people who use our software. We, we are a, a nonprofit co-op organization of 700 plus members. And our board of directors is made up of some of those members. So it's a sort of unusual model. It's worked really well. We're in about year 20 or so, um, and it's going really well. And um, I'm pleased to hand it to Nicole, who's a longtime uh, friend and colleague of mine and, and a real innovator in our community. So Nicole. Hi, Mia. Uh, I'm Nicole Keating, the Assistant Vice President of Business Intelligence here at the Adrian R. Center for the Performing Arts of Miami-Dade County. And the Adrian R. Center opened uh, back in 2006. Uh, it was a brand new venue, and the R. Center has been on Tessitura since before the opening. Um, I've been a Tessitura user for over 13 years now, and um, because of the principles of Tessitura and being really, really grounded in the community, um, we were, I was able to, to work with Matt in order to help create the solution and then bring it to Tessitura Network. So it's very exciting to have uh, Kristen and to be on this panel. Nice. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks again. And uh, I hope you caught the, um, the hashtag Boston Blockchain and, and the ads uh, for the speakers. You can find those on Twitter and LinkedIn under hashtag Boston Blockchain. So, Matt. How did this whole thing get started? You know, everybody always wants to know, uh, you know, you started this from nothing, right? So tell us the, a quick story about how it got started. <laughs> so the, the, the specific partnership between Nicole and I, I think happened over a, a Mojito happy hour in Miami at a ticketing conference. Uh, at that time, we had built a, a B2C focused solution. We had actually built a mobile application, um, but we were thinking about evolving the concept to something that was B2B, uh, pluggable, more scalable, um, and easier to take to market. And Nicole was interested in what we were doing, interested in blockchain. And I think the first time we met, she said, I said, hey, we, you know, we have an application. She said, I don't want anything to do with your application. Uh, can you figure out how to take your technology and plug it into our ticketing system to make our ticketing system that much better? And that, that was in November of 2018. So it's been a two year journey. Um, and, you know, we, we actually kind of almost on that two year anniversary did the first post COVID show, uh, November 5th. And we did another one on the 7th in Miami. Okay. Um, hold that thought. Hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> so Nicole, um, I, Matt said, you said, I don't want an app. Why, why, right. why? Um, I, I have issues with the apps just because I know on my own device, like I'm, 75% of our audience only comes once. So do people really want this extra app on their phone that then the R Center has to maintain? It just seemed like extra um, procedural things that shouldn't necessarily be necessary just to watch a show. Um, and, you know, that some blockchain's been something that's interested me for uh, several years now. I'm not sure if I even told you this, Matt, but first discussed ticketing and blockchain at a Tessitura network conference and because we have open space discussions. And one of our colleagues was had open sp a space just talking about is blockchain the, the solution to all of our ticketing woes? And it was like, and so that set the light bulbs off. And so when I had that first discussion with Matt, um, it really put things together really quickly for me. And it was like, yeah, something like this could be a great partnership. So segue over to uh, Kristen uh, around the Tessitura network. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, I know you gave us a little bit of introduction, but where is your nuance in this? And I know Kristen, you're a, a big advocate, well-known speaker around digital transformation and the di digital evolution. So can you link those together for us? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Nicole really sitting around that conversation table at our conference and thinking about this, I mean, it's essentially, it's this age old problem in ticketing, right? I mean, like, like ticketing is like its roots were back when the paper ticket is currency, right? If you lose it, you it's lost. Um, if you have it, it doesn't matter if you bought it, you can get in the door, right? And, and then the whole era of the the computer showed up and all of the, the fraud that is possible with digital reproduction um, showed up. And so, and we really are, have had this long protracted period of that happening uh, in the ticketing industry. And, you know, the introduction of blockchain is really sort of that first moment where, you know, the integrity of that 
that chain of ownership can actually be put back in place. And so it's incredibly, I mean, disruptive in a good way and incredibly innovative um, use of, of that technology. And so it's quite exciting to us um, from the tes Tessitur, you know, product evolution standpoint. Um, you know, our, our member organizations look to us to provide really solid technology that, that protects their interests. And so to really have, um, you know, ticket fraud and, and um, ticket security is a huge topic always. And so having this really, um, this innovation come out of the community, which is so normal for us. Um, it's so normal to hear from the Arch Center about innovation, by the way. Um, but a lot of our members are doing this kind of great innovation out there. And, and so we're just so pleased to have met Matt and just how you know wonderful the product has been put together. And um, it's been a great, um, great getting this off the ground. Um, I guess specifically to digital transformation. I mean, that's really I can go on and on about that. Like, there's a whole bunch of thoughts around. What, that are, what are some of the, the 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 big ones? I think that it's you know when you think about digital transformation and getting you know technology tools into the right hands in an organization to really sort of push forward the operational efficiency of the organization, the the culture, you know how organizations relate to their constituents or their customers, um, you know thinking about how technology can really advance the specific purpose of that organization. You know, that's that's sort of the potential of digital transformation. Um, you know, I think that this really, thinking about how much organizations like Nicole's, you know, the Arsh Center are dealing with ticket fraud in various ways, um, are dealing with anonymous people walking in the door, you know, where you buy four tickets, but you have, as a, as the venue, you have no idea who those other three people are. You just know who bought the ticket, you know, the order, whose whose name is on the order. So being able to have a much more granular look at a sort of a ticket, a digital ticket, and understanding who's holding that, and if it's a, a legit holder of that ticket is a really big deal. So, so that helps. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely helps. So that touches on, I think, one of the core um, justifications for this whole piece, this whole technology. So, so Matt, um, talk about um, the why, why ticketing, right? And then Nicole, um, I want you to talk about, you know, the, the ticket holder and getting that information and why that's so important. So Matt? Yeah, so why ticketing? And I like to use a construct. Um, I, I was tutoring a course at Oxford on blockchain for the, the past couple of years, and they, they, they recently uh, stopped the course, but I, it, course, it was a course I enjoyed. And I would talk with basically mid to upper level management people about how to think about blockchain. And when you take a step back and, and you're thinking kind of across industries, blockchain is a, is a good potential solution when you have an asset or a license and it's being transacted via multiple external parties, and there's significant friction in that transaction, right? So whether it's cost, time, quality, resources, what have you, that sets you up for a situation where blockchain could be a potential solution. I'm not saying it's the solution, but you look at that and you go, okay, well, that that's a, uh, you know, it could be a potential uh, solution for that problem. And then you have to think about, well, what do I want it to do? And, and blockchain is really good at a couple things, right? So integrity of the asset, you know, that's ticketing. There's a couple others, integrity of the path, which is supply chain, and integrity of the process, which is more digital supply chain. But from that construct, you can just see right away, look, ticketing is a good fit. The other thing too, is we always, you know, before I segue to Nicole, we always get asked, well, what about just centralizing the problem? And you have to understand, to understand ticketing is it's a distributed problem, right? So the R Center is is never going to be able to centralize or Tessitura is never going to be able to centralize all the ticketing because you need these kind of marketplaces, right? So you need this control coupled with distribution because the R Center is never going to be as get the reach that like a SeatGeek or um, Eventbrite or some of these other more marketplace focused, more commercial focused distribution channels will get. So how can you couple control with distribution in this distributed uh, system? And we feel that a distributed technology is best suited to solve a distributed problem. Okay, well, we'll get into the technology a little bit more deeper in, in a minute. So, Nicole, talk about it from your perspective as the venue. Sure, from a venue perspective, um, you know, you, you hope that an audience is moved to tears by a beautiful moment on stage. You don't want audience members moved to tears because they feel like they've been ripped off. Um, and I can't count how many times this has happened to our guests. And our initial... Um, thought process behind it was 
then we just need to make sure that we have the control of of the sale and then it's only to the one and we just don't honor any resale and we'll do whatever we can to block ticket brokers and and if someone is a fraudulent um, or nefarious user we'll block that sale from happening so we've tried that single distribution channel kind of ideology behind ticketing and it only works so far because eventually you've got a subscriber who's loyal who just can't go to a performance and and because of the industry it's very difficult to allow for certain types of of returns back into the system because of the contracts that are involved. So then you start thinking about, well, how can I, I change this problem so that instead of just having everything on lockdown and, and canceling orders, if you know that they're from a fraudulent um, purchaser, then is there a different way of looking at this? Is there a way of allowing um, that chain of possession to still happen in the world, but to be able to give transparency to the sale and to be able to show people from the very beginning what that original price was so that people know up front if they're paying more than what they think that they should. Um, There's so many times when you'll have like the old paper versions of printed homes where you'll have ticket brokers who white out over the seat locations and put in a different seat location. And they come up with this piece of paper with a family of four. And what do you do when you're sold out? There's very little that you can do. So we're just trying to allow tickets to be back in the fans and to be in within our community without having these nefarious practices involved. Yeah, because when somebody has a problem, they don't go to the guy that sold them the ticket. Right. They go absolutely true. Yeah. And, and they think it's us, actually. They think that we're the ones who charged them $1,000 for a $50 ticket. They don't understand. Um, you know, they just Googled something and their SEO took them somewhere and they think it's the right place. And a lot of times it's not. Right. And then from a Tessitura standpoint, Nick, um, Kristen, uh, I would say that you're you're obviously Tessator is obviously involved in a lot more than just ticketing, right? Uh, fundraising, donations, mm -hmm. CRM, that whole piece. So, connect the dots between this data around the who's walking in the door with your CRM and and what the implications are for the brand. Well, I think it's um, you know. I I think that the anonymous ticket buyer, for a lot of reasons, there's before the pandemic, there were security concerns, right? And and you have these large venues um, with a bunch of people walking in, flooding in at a certain time. And so on, on site, you know, just being aware of who's in the building is really important. And then of course, there's all of the long tail of, of marketing potential, which is what we're all about, you know, being able to really, um, come back and, and understand what a particular purchaser or a, a particular attendee might want to do next, you know? So that whole evolution of what that patron journey could be is, is hugely, it's, it's, you're operating in the dark in a lot of cases when you just don't know, you know that somebody bought a family ticket for this show, but um, you're appealing to a household or one person who bought for friends. So, um, that that has huge potential in the in the future to be able to really get at and at at that recipient level of who's actually holding the ticket, um, and so we think a lot about that. We definitely have um, in our CRM. There's a lot of a lot of capability to really we have at like sort of the subline level in an order the ability to track who the name who's associated with that, but it's largely blank in a lot of cases. So, you know, this just gives a different uh, way of of looking at that. Um, you know, through through actually understanding who's on site. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call randomly. Got a little distracted there. Um, so I don't know if that that helps answer, but it's definitely an end-to-end -end marketing kind of opportunity. Um, of course, you have to be transparent about that. You know, what like that the data is is yours to use, and there's PII involved and all that. So you need to make sure that you have permission to use the data. But that is absolutely um, a big potential upside of this. And Matt, I heard you say earlier in your, in your introduction, I think you were talking about, uh, or maybe it was an offline conversation that we had, you were talking about GDPR and compliance and things like that. You also mentioned something, Matt, about um, automated bots that are scooping up massive blocks of tickets. 
And, and the way I understand it is if that happens, they then resell those tickets at whatever prices they get and they keep the Delta, correct? So that doesn't go back to the venue, the artist, um, right? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, hundred percent. Initially, when we started True Tickets, our, our thought that the value proposition about what we're doing is there's all these there's all these venues, there's all these organizations that are leaving money on the table on the secondary market, and conceptually the problem is the same. However, the the rationale for wanting to do this is a little bit different. So, if you're a for-profit venue, you are concerned about the secondary market leaving money on the table. There's 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 the monetization piece you're missing out on. For nonprofits, what we've really learned, the concept is the same, the rationale is a little bit different. And Nicole and Kristen kind of highlighted it. It's it's about brand, it's about that connection. And so Nicole is not, her mission is not a profit-driven mission. Her mission at the Art Center is to make the arts available for the greater Miami-Dade community. And so that might mean that they're not looking to price a ticket at market. What they wanna do is they wanna price certain tickets so the broader community can access them. And what you find is you know, when tickets go on sale, if tickets range from $50 to $1,000, the ones being bought and, and flipped by brokers are not the $1,000 tickets, they're the $50 tickets. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And so what we really do is we help the Adrian R Center meet their mission why, to, to be able to, to, to deliver that so that those tickets, if they want to sell a ticket for $25, they can, they can control it, they can make sure it gets out there, they can make sure it does not get misused. If they want to sell a ticket for a thousand dollars, they can do that too, and they can have the same controls, or they can they they can relax those controls for a certain type of ticket or a certain ticket license. And that that's the biggest thing is that there's different rationales for it, um, but the the concept of just being able to provide control and distribution is key to both those. That's right, and and uh, I also remember you talking about the the whole issue of digital rights. But but before we get to that, so Nicole, you had your first event we did yeah so last week yes we, we've event. actually had two what events happened? um and that have been um using true tickets and they both went really well um and one of which was a free event so because it's a free event and we've got another free event coming up there is this um it's nice to know that you've got the security of true tickets behind those because then you know that they're not going to necessarily show up on the secondary market without any controls around them. So it's possible that some somebody, you know, scooped up some tickets and are trying to resell them. But we can also, you know, cancel the tickets and know exactly the chain of, of custody of those tickets. So, um, yeah, everything's going really well and everything um, and we're seeing taking video of everybody using um true tickets in order to to give back feedback to matt and his team but yeah so far so good everything's going really well so did you have any any people scooping up tickets trying to resell them or no we haven't noticed that at this point um we are continuing to monitor just to see if we see anything that that happens to show up on the web on some you know some ticket broker site or anything like that but so far so good do you feel like you got a hundred percent of the information from the attendees? Yeah. One of the interesting things about ticketing in general is that, um, and Kristen can, can ditto this. It is kind of an old school mentality. And so you still have some people who are, who are like, Oh, well this donor, you, they need to pick up their hard tickets at the box office window. And so when things like that happen, you end up having this gap um, because it's not necessarily going to show up on true tickets if I don't have the email address. So part of it's this education of the consumer to let them know we're going to need your email address for every ticket, including if it's a company order or a house order and all these types of things that we just have in, in this industry. So there's this huge opportunity in order to educate people. But yes, everything that um, was all purchased online all has the chain of custody and everything of that sort. So we are trying to figure out these institutional people gaps, you know, as far as how we're going to get our, our people to um, realize that this is a new um a new way of doing things. And I know Matt, you've been talking a lot about user experience and how 
you know, the, the user experience doesn't have to suffer be, just because you're going to the new technology of blockchain. So before, before I ask you about that question, Nicole, how was the user experience? Did people complain? Did they, did you get a lot of confusion or anything like that? Um, for us, the the biggest issue that we had was really login, um, because people aren't used to having to log in to anything in order to get their tickets. So that's the piece of education that we're going to have to do. But as soon as they were able to log in, they knew exactly what it was that they needed to do next. Um, so that's where we are right now. Is and that was the true tickets um, functionality. User yeah, experience. it's just, well, and it has to do with our own process of forget login um, through the Arsh Center. So it's just a little bit of something that the Arsh Center is working through. But as far as, you know, getting through the ticket itself worked like a charm, no, no issues whatsoever. So, so Matt, talk, talk about user experience. What, what's your focus on that? You know, what yeah, I think, uh, I mean, one, one of the things to note about our service is that uh, one of the services, one of one of our microservices is what we call the ledger service, and, and that that leverages blockchain. There's another dozen or so microservices that actually sit around that to create a business solution. And so when we talk about the ticket front end, you know, that, that look, that's a web framework. It's a it's a web application that people are using to access the ticket. That is a microservice we had to build to build to provide that last mile for consumers like Cole who don't have digital ticket delivery. They don't have a mobile application. They don't have they don't have a front end for that. And so what I like to think is we've actually built a solution. And a lot of that has to do with engaging with partners like Nicole and Kristen and their users. For us, we did over 100 hours of user testing. And we're, we're always doing user testing. And we're always looking at videos and looking for feedback and looking for ways to make every one of our microservices better. One of the things that I like to say about blockchain is that it doesn't suffer from an adoption problem. It suffers from a user experience problem. And anybody building or thinking about building a blockchain or distributed ledger technology solution needs to really understand what are the core dimensions of the, the user experience and what are their expectations in those dimensions. And you have to meet them across the board. There's no saying, well, in, in dimension X, I'm going to make, I'm just going to give you so much more that in dimension Y, you're going to, you're going to accept a, a degradation in, in the expectation. That's not going to happen. A, a good example is airline Wi-Fi. 15 years ago, you used to get on a plane. You just accepted the fact, hey, I'm just going to load up my Outlook or I'm just going to watch a movie. And then once I get you know, an internet connection, then it'll blast those out or I'll, I'll just reconnect. Well, once we got comfortable and used to airline Wi-Fi, that became an expectation. And now, you know, for those of you who have gotten on a plane, I haven't gotten on a, since actually I was in Miami in February. Um, but, you know, for those who have or when we get back on planes, there's an expectation that I'm going to have internet service, I'm going to be able to work. And if, if that's not met, I'm upset. I'm not happy. And that's one of the things where I think the blockchain community has struggled to do well is think through, truly understand the, the, the core user expectations and the dimensions and meet them where they're at. Obviously, look, there's benefits that the technology can provide that go above and beyond in certain dimensions, but you can't expect you know, a surplus in one dimension to offset another. Okay. Well, great. So, so, so Kristen, um, when we were talking um, a, a, a last week, you had said that one of the distinctives of working with Matt at True Tickets was that he was willing to spend two years. You know, he was willing to spend the time it took. Now, how old is Tessitura? Oh, gosh, it's uh, 1998 really was the very start. Um, yeah. Officially, I think it was 2001 that we formed the company. But yeah. So 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 I would call it what what I would call an incumbent company. Right. Yes, we, we are. Yep. So you have to, so, so talk, talk and speak to the people in the audience that are with incumbents, right? Yeah. What do you need to tell them about this experience in this whole piece of your business? Well, we have, you know, we have, I think it's about a 95% customer retention rate over 20 years. So it's pretty, pretty impressive that, you know, um, that people come on to Tessitura and they find it. And a lot of what we do is about unifying a bunch of disparate data sources into one system so that you can take good action on like what the customer knowledge, you know, the knowledge about the customer is. I, I think about a lot of, uh, 
you know, it's, this is my world thinking about us as an enterprise software company and how there's so much innovation happening out uh, in sort of the web first world. And, and we are, um, we have a, a tremendous amount of investment in, um, in our e-commerce platform, our API, I would say actually is the biggest of the products that we offer. We, we are an API first company and that we build our API before we put anything on top of it. We don't sort of create pockets of API, um, you know, utilization and that's sequestered over here. We actually have one API that we published to our community to innovate on. So anyway, all of this is sort of just backstory to say that we we are very forward thinking about the fact that we cannot do everything. Um, we try to be, we say all the time, if we had, we are a virtual company, but if we had real hallways, we would be echoing this down the hallway constantly, but we want to be the best in the world at what we do and partner out to do the rest of it. And this is one of those areas where we just, you know, it's a deep knowledge set you've got to have to do this well. And so, you know, we knew that blockchain was coming along in our industry. Um, we talked to a few other startup companies about this. Um, and ultimately it was really the proficiency of Matt and his team that really won us over. It was just like, and then frankly, and this is how so much innovation happens in our world. You know, it was the Arsh Center who just said, we want to work with Matt and we're, and Hey, Tessa Turi, you should come to this meeting and hear about this. And so we really got a, a front row seat um, to this, this evolution that was happening. And so the API is out there. You don't need to talk to us to get permission to use it. And so the fact that that was sitting there and that integration was possible. Um, and then we just really got behind it when we saw how powerful, powerful it was. Nice. API first. So unifying data, data sources, um, uh, Matt, what did you learn from working with an incumbent? Um, you know, you've been on a, on a pretty rapid um, innovation cycle, uh, you know, 24 months from nothing. Uh, I'm sure you're really glad to have been working with somebody like Kristen who really gets digital transformation. I'm sure she snowplowed a lot of the roads and, um, and there were no obstacles at all, really. Right. <laughs> But, well, but being from Minnesota, I can definitely understand uh, snow plowing roads. So uh, <laughs> what's a plow? Kristen is all that and more. Look, we're, we're very fortunate to have the partners we have. Right. Um, and I think for us, you know, one of the things that I think we were able to do well in that Kristen and the Tessitura team recognizes we're, we're not competitive with one another. We're actually, we're, we're cooperative, right? So when you think about Tessitura, they're an incumbent, but I'm not competing with Tessitura. I'm not, I'm not actually even competing with Ticketmaster. I'm a custodial solution. I secure the ticket from point of sale to point of scan. Our goal is to take the ticketing piece off um, their, their plates part of the thing that we secure that as, as well as possible. And that, that's been our goal to say, look, much, much like, let's say, um, commercial banks, right? You have Goldman Sachs, you have JP Morgan, you have Citibank, they're the commercial banks. And then you have, you know, my wife works at State Street and there's BNY Mellon, there's custodial banks. They're not, they work together. They're not competitive. We view ourselves as a custodial solution. And one of the things that I appreciate about Kristen and our relationship with Tessitura and the partners with, with, that we've built the solution with is they've understood that. And it's been very easy to have that, that communication. And then that has allowed us to build a, a truly performant and effective solution because it, it takes time and it takes partners. If we think about what I think we're demonstrating here as a group is really the, the framework through which enterprise 3.0 solutions should be built. If you think of enterprise 1.0, that was literally just taking stuff off, you know, uh, machine, you know, hard hardware and putting it on the cloud. You know, that, that was something like Salesforce, right? Uh, the first version of Salesforce. Enterprise 2.0 is then taking that data and then really understanding it, aggregating it, developing insights from it. That was Enterprise 2.0. Enterprise 3.0 now is the next kind of nut to crack. And that's where you're going to have true enterprise collaboration and partnership. And if you're going to solve industry level problems, you need these minimum viable ecosystems of, let's say, a ticketing system, a, a Tessitura, several of their partners like the R Center to come together and say, look, if we're going to solve an industry level problem or we're going to change this industry, we have to work together to do it. And, and that's really what I appreciate, especially about Kristen and Nicole. Plus one to everything you just said. <laughs> nice. So, so speaking of that, Nicole, Matt was kind of just touching on the future. And I'm just curious, 
you know, we're just getting started here, right? Just getting started just as we end 2020. You've done your first couple of events. Mm -hmm. Two years, three years from now, this is going to be, you know, you're going to watch this. Oh, yeah, I was so young. <laughs> right? <laughs> but uh, what are your hopes and dreams for, you know, the new technology that will potentially change the way the Performing Arts Center works and all of that. What are some of your your wildest aspirations for this? Sure. Um, uh, some of the, the longer term goals that I have for this it are really uh, that we can allow with rules wrapped around everything, allow customers to, um, to resell tickets for some people in some areas for certain amounts above whatever the, the original price is and that we figured that piece off, but maybe not all of them and maybe not for everyone. It really is going to have to depend on the shows because we have these contracts with shows that are, that are important as well. And so really trying to figure out the whole uh, resale the right way and um, and share the right way so that it has the transparency that we're really looking for in in a ticketing solution. So that's the part that I'm most excited about is working out what those are. Um, we have a few POC partners who help who worked on kind of brainstorming what all of this could be for the future. And it's really because of those discussions that we're able to think about all of the exciting things that we want to do in the future. Um, how about you, Kristen, on the, on the future? Wh where do you think things are going? Uh, you know, digital transformation is such a huge thing, but just if we could, if we could just focus on maybe ticketing and, and a couple of the circles around that. Well, we serve um, a whole sort of spectrum of, of, of users. They're all arts and culturals, um, but, you know, all the way from theater to ballet to museums and zoos, um, large performing arts centers like Nicole. Um, so, and very small, you know, very small theaters as well. Um, so it's, I, I think about the future a lot and sort of taking that spectrum of users out there and as an arts and culture like patron, what do I, what is the experience that I most want to have? And a lot of this is happening right now in this huge compression that we're in with digital transformation really in, in warp speed right now with, with the pandemic. And it's happening across every industry. Um, ironically, with a lot of our organizations, the doors are, have been closed all year, right? And we have been busier than ever. So a lot of what we're doing over here as a technology company is innovating the heck out of things, you know? And so when I think about the future is sort of fast forwarding what we're working on now. I mean, it's like thinking about getting, you know, they say in software that the best user interface is like in, an invisible one, right? Where you're just not even aware you're interfacing with technology. And that really is the, the arts and culture experience of the future. I think it's like, you can walk in the door. You don't have to know, you don't have to go find some clunky kiosk. You don't have to go like, log in somewhere, hopefully eventually, right? Where the login thing is a huge thing to solve for everyone. Um, but that that you start to become more more known in that sort of way of like walking up to something and, and getting access because of who you are. Um, so we think a lot about that um, in terms of the future. <clears throat> and I think that it's also just about, you know, the, the initial expansion of, of, of digital marketing was it's now we're sort of in a, in a backlash where it's like, you know, privacy is a huge, huge thing for all of us. And I, I think about really granular controls around that privacy and, and knowing to, to speak to the right audience at the right time and all that stuff, but like really having that granular control. So we respect people and it's all about building that trust essentially and helping the organizations that use Tessitura build that trust and that incredible experience of coming in and, and being surrounded by art and culture and, and not inhibited by technology, but assisted by it. Well, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying, studying social technologies. And, and if there's one thing about social technologies is that, that people, people will tell other people when they've had a really good experience and when they've had a really bad experience, right? Yep. And they don't really know all the details behind 
why, I mean, sometimes they do obviously, right? But, but a lot of times they really don't. And so, and technology is one of those riddles that is further separating, you know, what actually is happening versus what people are experiencing. But certainly performing arts and, um, and entertainment, it's all about, it seems to me anyway, and I'm not an expert on this, but it seems to be it's all about what, what their expectations are and what they, why they came to the show, right? Absolutely. So, so they just want to fly into the show, right? And, and no fuss, right? Okay. So that kind of goes to the technology, Matt. Um, talk to us about the blockchain technology. I know that you have some proprietary things that you don't want to talk about and for sure. But, you know, can you tell us what's on chain and, and a little bit more about that? Yeah, and Kristen, Kristen talked about it with data, data privacy. In you know, before I joined, before I left to, to lead True Tickets, I was actually working in corporate innovation for a French company based in the U.S. And obviously, you know, GDPR, the, the the general data privacy regulation that now is is law in Europe. It's not here in the U.S. It's actually here in a California form. I think it's CCPA is the California form. But basically, it means if, if somebody wants, it's the right to be forgotten. If somebody wants their data removed from a database, um, any personally identifiable information, they can do that. Well, obviously, when you think about blockchain, it, it's irrefutable. You can't change it. You can't change the past. And so you have to think smartly through uh, how you architect your solution. And so one of the things that, that we, we've done is we capture uh, what we think is, and we worked with our partners on this, we put the minimum information necessary on chain. So all the ticket details, the rules around the ticket. Um, we use a alphanumeric hash, so a randomly generated alphanumeric hash to log users. So when a, a testator or a client like the R Center installs our service, we actually uh, amend their constituent records to, to add a data field. It says, look, for you know, for Nicole, she's going to be ABC123, Kristen's going to be DEF456. And so then on our chain, when tickets are transacted, if Nicole buys two tickets, ABC123 has two tickets, she shares it with Kristen, it goes from ABC123 to DEF 456. And then we write all that data back. Not only is it logged on our chain, but we actually write that back into a custom table in Testatura. So that way then Nicole knows real time what's happening with the tickets. Now, obviously they on their end, they have to do some data matching, but it's actually considering the benefit of having you know a, a GDPR compliant, CCPA compliant solution, it's a pretty minimal lift. I know it's a little bit of a lift on their end to match the data, but they're getting that data real time. And this is really important in ticketing. We've talked with several clients who have ticketing systems that they provide them the data, but it's a query and it's provided two days later. Well, that, that's too late. Um, and so we're, we've been able to architect, I think, a, a highly efficient solution. We've minimized the, the data on chain, which I think is the right thing to do and, and really optimized it. So not only are, have, we, have we architected it with data privacy in mind, but we've also tried to optimize it to the best we can for, for the ticketing use case. One of the questions from the audience revolves around why Hyper, why IBM Hyperledger? Why did you choose that technology? Yeah, so I, I like to refer us as we are built on Hyperledger fabric. We run on the IBM blockchain and we deploy it to Google Cloud. So we, we are a pretty, pretty broad solution in that regard. And when you think about uh, blockchains, distributed ledger technology, however you want to refer to them, there's really three things you want them to do, and there's really only two things you can get them to do, right? So systems architecture is all about trade offs. And what people want is they want security, they want decentralization, and they want scale. Well, when you look at some of the public chains like Bitcoin or Ethereum, you're getting security and you're getting decentralization, but there's a, a core aspect that in ticketing makes it a little bit challenging and it's around identity. And in those solutions, identity is, is, is pseudonymous, right? It's not completely anonymous, but then to do that, you basically scale suffers because you can't have somebody hack you can't have somebody figure out how to put fake Bitcoin or fake Ethereum on that chain. And so they use proof of work. That's how they architect it to prevent to get that. They made it, they make it prohibitively expensive for someone to do that. If you look at ticketing and you look at Hyperledger, ticketing is different in this case because it's an enterprise to enterprise solution. The identities are actually known. And you might say, well, if Mike's selling a ticket, 
how is that identity known? Well, if Mike's selling a ticket on StubHub, the backend transaction is actually between StubHub and the R Center or something like that. So you're seeing these enterprise to enterprise relationships, and that's really what Fabric does much better than some of the public chains. And so we get scale and we get security at the detriment of decentralization. And look, that's an architecture choice, but we feel comfortable with that choice because again, the entities are known. So now what Arsh can do is say, look, we have this service. We'd love to use these distribution channels, X, Y, and Z. They're going to enter into a legal agreement for how this is going to work, and then they'll be executed. And you have those legal wrappers around the enterprise framework. And that's critical in ticketing because if you can't process 1,500 transactions a second, 24-7, 365, you're not a ticketing solution. And that goes back to knowing your customer dimensions and, and, and finding the best fit solution for the problem. I see you nodding your head, Kristen. You, uh, you have a comment <laughs> on that? It's just, uh, I don't know probably five years of my life have, has been spent on the topic of, of high high capacity, high demand uh, on sale events. So Nicole has been in the trenches with me on several several Hamilton on sales, for instance. Um, no, there's just literally, I would say the Tessitur network fields, you know, in the thousands of, of high volume events a year. And it's it's a real thing you have to scale for. And it it is fairly unique to the ticketing industry in that regard. It's not like I mean, you have to have real time sort of, you know, accountability for a retail system. Um, you have to know how many uh, widgets are on the shelf still, but there's a real, it's rare that you're, you've got this Black Friday kind of crush to get, you know, all of those those Nike shoes sold. That's not the norm. Um, usually it's a little more distributed time-wise. And there's a, something about the ticketing industry and just that enormous, like 10, 10 a.m., all the tickets go on sale. And so it just needs a different kind of, of architecting. But on the true ticket side, you're, if you're, I, I don't know how many clients you have, but your, your system is going to be eventually used by a lot of different clients all at the same time, right? So yeah. I think that's what you're referring to, Matt, right? Yeah. And the thing, this goes back again to how we architected it. And so, you know, one of the things that we've actually worked with IBM and, and some of the fabric programmers on is they didn't really initially envision their solution being used in the way we're using it. The R Center has their own chain. We're, we're going to be launching in California here in about two weeks. They're going to have their own chain. And you might think, well, that makes no sense. But it actually does because what we want to do is we want them to these all these individual chains, but then accessing these multiple, this massive multi-channel distribution marketplace. Now, all those distribution channels, they'll have to align and essentially standardize to the chain, to, to our technology, if they want our inventory or our client in California or however many other clients we bring on. So we're actually forcing standardization in a bit of a different way than, than people have seen it in this industry before. And so that, that's how it works for us. And that's how we also work with scaling. The What happens with Arsh and their on sales don't actually impact or take away from any of the performance, uh, performant nature of the solution that, that we'll be implementing in California, as well as subsequent implementations. Okay, so we got a question from Pete Harris with the Austin Blockchain Collective. Um, I guess that's Austin, Texas. Any thoughts? I'm a fan. <laughs> What'd you say? I alma mater. Beautiful um, city. Oh, UT. Yeah, okay. UT Austin, man. <laughs> yeah. I've lived there many years. Yeah. Good. Well, maybe you can answer this one then, <laughs> Kristen. Any thoughts on integration between ticketing and health? passport systems so that attendees at events can assert that they are healthy. Uh, there was an interesting article in Billboard about this yesterday regarding Ticketmaster. Yeah, I, I read that article. Um, you know, it is something that we're actually, we're, we're discussing as and on my team as the product team to to evaluate this. The, the pandemic has been full of interesting challenges and, and, and twists and turns for the entire world, obviously. And, um, and some of what like we were approached early on um should we be should we be doing contact tracing you know we are a customer um you know data store um and we opted to not do that because all the regulations locally you know vary um and there were other systems that could do that now this vaccine uh tracking is interesting we're like i said we haven't really uh determined yet if we're going to move forward with that. But I think it's interesting if, if it can be standardized enough to be implemented. Um, if it's got a lot of variance, you know, it's early, early days on this, but there's definitely some interest in our, in our company in evaluating that. So TBD. Okay, great. Nicole, uh, a question that just came in. Can you walk us through and, and 
I hate to put you on the spot, and this is kind of, um, Matt, where your demo would have come in handy, but can you walk us through the user experience of somebody buying a ticket? Sure. The, um, the act of purchasing a ticket is really not anything different from the way you'd normally purchase a ticket. So you can purchase on the phone or online or in person. And really what we're changing in Tessatura is our delivery method. And so just like you might have printed home delivery method or a USPS delivery method, instead we just have our digital true tickets delivery method. And so the user experience, um, they might not notice that they're even doing that because there are some things that we have on our website where it's just automatically taking you to that delivery method. Right now, all of our tickets are being delivered via true tickets. We're not doing any hard tickets right now. Um, and so, that all happens behind the scenes or if we do allow in the future for there to be a choice of hold it box office or usps then they'll see that as a delivery method change and then um it is just messaging about on the couple days before the show just here click on this link and log into your account in order to access your tickets and by clicking on that link they're then going into their wallet which is taking you to true tickets Sounds easy enough. Where where are the obstacles in there? Any any particular points of friction? Like I said before, I think the biggest friction point is just the fact that people need to be able to log in. And if they do that right away, then it remembers, you know, my phone remembers my login and 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 I can, you know, sign in with my face so I don't ever have to remember my password again but it's just that very first time of remembering your login remembering your user id and once that piece has happened one time as long as your phone's you know set to remember those things then you don't have to worry about it anymore but that's really the biggest point of friction right now and because it's all brand new for us that's really the only friction that i see yeah, I, I heard somebody say recently, I have no problem with passwords. I just use the forget my password every time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to tack on one thing there. Just just um, so that's the arched path and just to sort of flush it out. And I think this is probably mm -hmm. the case for you guys, too. But like I would say on average for across the 700 organizations using Tessitura that I don't know, anywhere between 70 and 90 percent of all transactions go through the web. It, this was before pandemic. And now it's like you know, you're consuming the art and culture from your from your living room now through digital stage. So, um, but but there's you know pretty much any any medium can be driven through. You know, the transaction can be driven through in, on any device ever. Um, and then on the on the if you're at the door and you got your ticket, the scanning the access control system is Tessitura as well. So it's just sort of like so. But as Matt said, it's basically what was your phrase, Matt? It was like from uh, such to such. Uh, from ticket, ticket purchase to ticket door uh, or something. Sale to scan. Sale to scan. Sale to scan. That's right. It was close. I, I've, yeah. got, I've got. I've got. A, I've got a Rolodex of, of these analogies. So I got <laughs> Mad isms. <laughs> Sorry. Keep going. Kurt, 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 no, that that was just it. It was just really. I mean, the end to end user journey is like you buy it on any device you've got. You you get the digital ticket. You, you all that Nicole said, and then you get scanned into the door. It should be pretty simple. Okay. Well, last question, Kristen, for you, um, and then we're, we'll just go around the horn with any closing thoughts. One of the things that we at the Boston Blockchain Association are trying to help people do is build an ecosystem, right? Build an ecosystem. And you've got the Tessitura network. And uh, Nicole, you're a, a prime example. I heard you mention that, that that's you know, where you first heard about blockchain and so forth. So Nicole or uh, Kristen, what advice do you have for people that are starting out that want to build an ecosystem? And I, I think of ecosystem in my world as a software provider, as partners who do things like Matt does. Okay. Is that what you mean? Or are you thinking more broadly in the word, word ecosystem, like a community? Yeah, I would say more of a community, partners, users. How do you how do you get that going and get it really humming? 
Yeah, it's, you know, this is such a huge part. Every software company in the world talks about their community and we're community led and all that. And I, this is one of those things about Tessitura that I found just astounding that really because we came out of the fabric of, um, we were we were created because the Metropolitan Opera in 1998 couldn't find a ticketing system that they liked. So they built one and then the Kennedy Center knocked on the door and said, can we can we use that system? And so it from day one was about a community sort of shared and collaborated um, technology platform that got built. So I was lucky in that regard um, is that in that we have from the beginning been focused in that direction. But I will say that, you know, I, I really believe strongly that if I were to start a company on my own, I would be doing it in a similar kind of collaborative way because I just don't. I think there's something really important about having um, that shared investment of like where are we headed, what are we, what are we building, and um, even though there was one entity in, in at the at the keyboard coding, and there was a sales entity involved, but there was a real collaboration and sort of sort of shared purpose. So I would just say find the people that do things that you like to do and uh, see if you can partner together and share knowledge. And that really is the magic. I mean, that's really how we got started as a company. And now we're 20 some odd years in and uh, sort of been my experience over and over. It's pretty simple, but that's that's how I see it. Well, a lot of times it's the simple things in life that make a big difference, right? It's the yeah. little things in life. So we should be, the uh, audience should be seeing the breakout session information in the chat window now. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But um, uh, so one, so final thoughts. Let's go, um, Nicole and Kristen and Matt. What are some closing thoughts that you really want people to take away? Sure. Um, I think that this is just the beginning of of a huge turning point in the ticketing industry. And I think we've only touched on that briefly, but the fact that because we now have this immutable ledger that tracks these things that we've never had in the past, I think that this is the, the beginning of a ticketing um, shift that we will all be benefiting from in the future. That's a really good comment. I like your word shift and driven by the actual structure of the technology, the blockchain technology. Yeah. In other words, it wouldn't be possible without that. Absolutely. Kristen, how about you? I mean, that is so well said. I mean, I, I feel like I, I just want, you know, I want the patron of arts and culture, the visitor in the museum, to feel really good about being there. And I just want to pick up on something Nicole said at the beginning. You want people to be crying because they're moved by what's on stage or in the gallery and not because of how the ticketing was handled. And so I I think this is just, it is, it is enormous. And I think it goes a long way to getting um, a really positive experience for those high attendance events. It's usually, it's, you know, ticket fraud is not a, a big deal for the low uh, desirability events. It's always the high, desirability events, right? And so I think that, that um, that's, there's a lot of expectations that people arrive at the venue and they want you want it to go well. So I, I'm quite excited about that, just making that customer experience uh, that much better. Just removing all of the drama associated with getting into the event. That's right. Can we just experience the event, please? Is, <laughs> right. Well, and it's true because the less drama there is to get in there, the more likely they will be affected by the event, right? Yes, but if absolutely. If you're sitting in your seat steaming, you know, uh, because of something that happened, you're just going to miss the whole thing. And then on the drive home, you're going to get in an argument with your spouse because they were, they're going to say, well, you didn't see that? You know, that was awesome. You know, I was like, no, I didn't see it because that guy was sitting next to me. So yeah, it sounds like it sounds like you've been there. So we want to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. That's why this is such a great, great um, big cast. So Matt, um, what what do you really want the uh, audience to take away? You know, the takeaway here, Mike, you kind of touched on it, but it, you know, I'll take it a, a different direction. Is obviously the the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room for us is COVID, right? And I'm not, I'm not sure what everyone who's listening to this thought when they were going to get on a, a, a panel or a webinar about ticketing. 
Um, but there's a quote from a, a CEO of a ticketing company that I like to use, and this is an unfortunate opportunity. And it's, you know, another quote is, you know, I'll paraphrase Winston Churchill, you know, never miss an opportunity to take advantage of a good crisis. And what is hopeful for, for us, for me, about what we're doing with our partners in this industry is that you hear it from Nicole, you hear it from Kristen, the enthusiasm about the future. Um, there's a, there's a, a lot of challenges in our industry today, and those do not go unnoticed, those do not go unrecognized. But what is fun for us is we are we are not mired in the today. We're we're focused on the future and we're excited about the future. And that and that's that's a fun place to be. It's a really fun place to be. Well, thanks a lot, Matt. I know you said that uh, I think you might have said it earlier in the vidcast that that uh, COVID nineteen was the nine eleven moment for the ticketing industry. And you know, there's always pros and cons and. Um, pains and pleasures associated with different things that happen in our lives. But we've seen this, um, this theme kind of repetitive over and over again with CBDC and digital identity and, and now, you know, and the DeFi and now ticketing that the things that are happening today could be blessings in disguise for the future. So thanks a lot, you guys. On behalf of the Boston Blockchain Association, we really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to uh, wrap up with a couple more slides. So again, we wanna thank our corporate members, Algorand, Bloomy, Pure Stake, Media Shower, Cardano Foundation, Fabric, the, Boston, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Boston Fed, and Mass Tech Collaborative. Thank you so much for helping us um, do this. Mark your calendars. Our next event is December 17th, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. We're gonna be talking about compliance. AML and KYC, we've got some really outstanding talent coming to talk to us about that. This has been organized by Doug McCalmont and um, Thank you, Doug, for doing this. Steve Ryan with CypherTrace, Max Lerner with State Street, and Wendy Hennigan with Fidelity Digital Assets. Uh, last but not least, we have the uh, breakout room. So Matt is going to be in breakout room number one regarding ticketing and blockchain, facilitated by Nate Rand. Kristen Darrow, room number two, talking about digital transformation and evolution, moderated by John Hargrave and Lily Chen. And number three, uh, Nicole is going to be in uh, talking about ticketing and venues and, and all of that. And I think we have a fourth uh, room as well, just for general net networking. So thanks a lot, you guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, again, on behalf of the Boston Blockchain Association, thank you to our speakers and thank you to our attendees. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you in the breakout rooms. Thank <laughs> you.